Hello, my name is Rick Weinserl, and I'm a professor and extension specialist in entomology in the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. This session in our beginning farmer program, Preparing a New Generation of Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Farmers, provides an introduction to pesticides and pesticide application. My objectives for this discussion are to help you learn or better understand the different categories of pesticides and different ways to classify or understand them, how pesticides are applied, ways to minimize the adverse effects of pesticide use, and the regulation of pesticide use. This introduction to pesticides is not a substitute for attending a pesticide applicator training program offered by the Illinois Pesticide Safety Education Program, and later in this discussion I'll provide more information about training and licensing for pesticide applicators. I'm going to provide an overview of the major categories of pesticides from several perspectives. Discuss formulations, modes of action, resistance management, residual versus knockdown pesticides, systemic pesticides, and selective versus non-selective pesticides. I'll provide links to some references that provide recommendations for the use of pesticides in fruits and vegetables and talk a little about pesticide application. I'll also provide some basics on ways to minimize the use of and the adverse effects of pesticides, primarily practicing integrated pest management and pesticide resistance management, avoiding environmental contamination and non-target impacts, and protecting human health by following label directions and restrictions, including REIs, or re-entry intervals, before workers go back into treated fields without protective clothing, and PHIs, or pre-harvest intervals, that must elapse between the last application of a pesticide and the harvest of the treated crop. The United States Environmental Protection Agency and the Illinois Department of Agriculture both have important roles in the regulation of pesticide use in Illinois, recognizing the distinction between general use and restricted use pesticides is very important, and that will lead into the explanation of licensing of pesticide applicators. Although certain details of pesticide applicator training differ among states, the general ideas will be relevant to all fruit and vegetable growers. We name pesticides according to what we intend to kill or control with them. Insecticides are for insect control, fungicides for control of plant pathogenic fungi, herbicides for weed control. Several other icides are all pesticides, and all are regulated under the Federal Insecticides, Fungicides, and Rodenticide Act and its amendments. It's important to realize that we use many substances to control unwanted organisms, not just the insects and weeds and crops, but bacteria in swimming pools and bathrooms and on kitchen counters, and mice that may invade houses or crops. We name them for their intended purpose, but many may be toxic at some level to other organisms, either immediately or over the course of repeated chronic exposures at low doses. Developing and using pesticides with minimal adverse effects on non-target organisms is an ongoing goal for manufacturers, users, and consumers. The active ingredients in pesticides, either synthetic or naturally derived, are almost never sold in pure form. They are mixed with carriers that make them more easy to mix with water in a spray tank or spread more evenly as a dust. So the pesticide product you purchase is called the formulated product or a pesticide formulation. The formulations on the left are dry products, dusts, powders, and granules. Dusts and some granules are applied dry. The other formulations are mixed with water. Constant agitation is required for products that do not dissolve. Numbers represent the percent active ingredient by weight in the formulated product. 75D is a 5% dust formulation of carbaryl. Brigade 10WP is a 10% wettable powder formulation that is to be mixed with water and form a suspension. It's going to be applied through a sprayer and the 10% refers to the portion of bifenthrin in that wettable powder that you purchase. The formulations on the right are sold in liquid form, emulsifiable or soluble concentrates, that are also to be diluted in water before application. 
In general, for liquid products, the numbers that are part of the label name represent the number of pounds of active ingredient per gallon in the formulated liquid product. So Brigade 2EC contains 2 pounds of the active ingredient bifenthrin per gallon of product. Pesticides are identified by three types of names. The chemical name that describes the molecular structure of the active ingredient, the common name used to identify that active ingredient, and the trade name used on the formulated product. One naphthal carbamate is carbaryl, and seven is the original trade name given to products that contain this active ingredient. You can see the chemical name of azadiractin, quite complicated even though it is a naturally occurring product, and one of the common names of, in, of azadiractin in terms of a formulated product is Nemix. The reason to point out these technicalities is that a single active ingredient may be sold under many trade names. The identity of the active ingredient in a pesticide product may not be apparent just on the trade name on the label. The label for this formulation of bifenthrin, a pyrethroid product, lists the common name and the chemical name of the active ingredient. Brigade 2EC contains 2 pounds of bifenthrin per gallon. It is a restricted use pesticide, something we'll discuss in a few moments. And other parts of the label also show that this is a group 3 insecticide for resistance management purposes, and they provide specific instructions on crops that can be treated, allowable rates, restrictions, and so on. Let's very briefly summarize some general characteristics of insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. For each group, modes of action describe in general the main way that the pesticide interferes with normal biological functions in target and in sometimes in non-target organisms. Most insecticides interfer, interfere with nerve impulse transmission in animals. Several interfere with the action of the neurotransmitters such as acetylcholinesterase. Others interfere with sodium channel ion exchange along nerve axons. They are used with relative safely, safety to humans and other animals because one, our exposures are very low in concentration with those encountered by insects, and two, our ability to detoxify the doses we encounter prevents the primary toxic effects from occurring. Over the last few decades, several insecticides have been developed that rely on modes of action other than the inhibition of nerve impulse transmission. Some are microbial insecticides that contain pathogens that infect and kill only certain groups of organisms, even certain groups of insects. Some interfere with growth or molting hormones, others disrupt insect mating behavior. All labels present IRAC numbers that describe the modes of action, and the website shown here provides for fungicides, FRAC codes. Modes of action codes identified and assigned by the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee recognize 12 broad modes of action, where multiple applications of a fungicide are needed over time. Rotating among products with different FRAC codes is recommended. A few older fungicides, such as Captan, have multiple modes of action, and even after decades of use, resistance to Captan remains, remains rare for most fungal pathogens. Fungicides are also classified as protectants versus eradicants. Protectant fungicides must be on the surface of the plant to prevent fungal entry and infection. They do not cure, even in very early stages of infection, any of the fungal infections that have already begun. A few fungicides are able to kill fungi after very early stages of plant infection. These are called eradicants, and they may be described as having some kickback or curative activity. Be aware, however, that their eradicant or curative value is only for very early stages of infection in most cases. Similarly, herbicides used to kill weeds are grouped according to their modes of action and assigned HRAC codes by the Herbicide Resistance Action Committee. Over a dozen different modes of action are recognized 
and using herbicides with different modes of action is recommended to slow the development of herbicide resistance in weeds. Widespread use of Roundup or glyphosate in corn and soybean production without rotations involving other weed control practices is widely cited as the reason for the evolution of glyphosate resistant weeds. Many herbicides that are effective for weed control in specific vegetable crops may be difficult to incorporate into small-scale mixed crop vegetable production systems because they persist in or on the soil and can injure subsequent rotation crops and because of the proximity of different vegetable crops to one another and the potential for drift from a, from a tolerant to a susceptible crop. We'll return to more detailed discussions of the use of pesticides and other practices for insect, weed, and disease control over the next few months, but the basics of insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides should make those discussions more relevant and understandable. For most pesticides, in addition to knowing the mode of action of the ingredients, how long the product lasts, and whether or not it moves into and within a plant or animal, is key in understanding how to and how not to use it effectively. Although there are exceptions, in most cases we want a pesticide residue to persist on a plant for at least a few days. And in fact, residues of many insecticides and other pesticides are effective on plant surfaces for five to seven days. We also do not want excessive residues to remain on harvested produce, persist in the soil, or move into water so rates and timing of applications are regulated accordingly. Systemic pesticides move in the vascular system of plants and in a few instances the circulatory system of animals for certain pest or pet and livestock insecticides. Most common is movement from roots to stems and leaves as is the case with the insecticide imidacloprid or admire, a neonicotinoid. The herbicide Roundup or glyphosate moves from leaves to roots, and labels and instructions for the use of pesticides always note whether or not the product is systemic. Some pesticides are broadly toxic to many organisms and others are more selective or specific. This is evident when one reads the label on a pesticide. It often states specifically which insects or weeds it kills or which fungal diseases it prevents. For example, most Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, products kill only caterpillars that eat them. Many new reduced-risk insecticides are effective against only certain orders or groups of insects. Some microbial insecticides that contain insect pathogens, such as insect-specific viruses, kill only larval stages of a single genus or species. These examples of selectivity differ phenomenally from the broad spectrum nature of old organophosphate, organochlorine, and carbamate insecticides. For herbicides, many pre-plant, pre-emergence, or post-emergence herbicides are selective. They may kill grasses, but not broadleaf weeds, or vice versa. Other herbicides, such as paraquat or glyphosate, are non-selective and kill most plants. A very few pesticides, primarily fumigants, are toxic, toxic to a very, very broad range of organisms at their common rates of use. Methyl bromide and other space or commodity fumigants fall in this category. So how do you identify what pesticides can be used in what crops to control or prevent specific pest problems? For tree fruits, the annually updated Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide and the Corn Cornell Guide for Organic Apple Production list spray recommendations for insect, plant disease, weed, and vertebrate pest control. For grapes and small fruits such as brambles, blueberries, and strawberries, the annually revised Midwest Small Fruit and Grape Spray Guide and the Cornell Organic Production Guides for certain small fruits provide spray, spray recommendations for specific pest problems. For vegetable crops, the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and Cornell's Organic Vegetable Production Guides for specific crops provide pesticide recommendations and other production and pest management guidelines. We cover integrated pest management in an upcoming lecture and discussion, but it's important to note now as well that spray guides 
list a wide range of pest problems, not all of which occur in any given field. They provide extensive listings of approved pesticides for crop and pest combinations. They do not cover all the production practices that might limit or avoid pest problems. That's not their purpose. Other references do cover cropping system design, monitoring or scouting, and other aspects of crop and pest management. Use the spray guides to understand what pesticides can be used effectively where they are needed. Production guides and spray guides provide very useful summaries. The pesticide label is the ultimate le legal document on how a pesticide can be used. Labels list target pests that the product controls. These are sometimes a bit too inclusive and checking the recommendations in spray guides may lead to uh, better selection of the most effective products for specific pests. But labels list the rate, often on a per acre basis, that can be used and the maximum number of applications that can be made and you never exceed those limits. Labels may instruct against application to blooming crops or weeds to prevent bee poisoning. They may restrict applications to areas in areas where water contamination be as, may be especially likely. And they also caution against application where wind speeds exceed the levels that are likely to cause drift. They state the pre-harvest interval, the re-entry interval, the time, and they state what must be done to comply with worker protection regulations regarding signage of treated fields, training employees, and provision of personal protective equipment. Let's look at how pesticides are actually used in fruit and vegetable production. To soil or seed for residual or systemic action, to soil as fumigants, to steam, stems, leaves, and fruits for knockdown, residual, or systemic activity, and to close spaces as fumigants to dis disinfest produce after Pesticides may be applied to the soil with the intent that they persist for several days at the location where they were applied so that they prevent crop damage from insects or prevent weed growth. Soil applied pesticides are usually incorporated or mixed at least lightly with the soil. Some are applied in a band, for example a width of seven inches or so that encompasses the row as the corn is planted in a cornfield for example, but not the area between rows. Insecticides applied to the soil for, for residual control of insect pests in the soil typically have soil half-lives, or the time it takes the product to break down to half of the level originally applied, of 30 to 90 days, much shorter than the old residual organochlorine insecticides used in the 1960s and 70s. Typically, they are very low in water solubility so that they do not leach into groundwater, and not every insecticide that is effective when applied to foliage is effective when used in the soil because many break down very rapidly in soil or they are bound very t tightly to soil particles and therefore unavailable to enter and kill the soil, in the soil insect pests that might otherwise contact them. Examples of the use of soil residual insecticides include applications around the foundations of homes prevent infestations of subterranean termites, and the use of soil insecticides applied in a band over the row to control corn rootworm larvae in cornfields. Soil applications of insecticides are sometimes used for seed and root maggot, grub, and wireworm control in vegetables. Where protecting seeds from insects or fungal pathogens is necessary, growers may buy treated seed or, in a few instances, apply treatments onto seeds after purchase. Most residual insecticides and fungicides used in this way are not systemic. They do not move upwards via the vascular system to above ground, plant portions, uh, above ground portions of plants. In comparison with band or broadcast applications of insecticides, seed treatments use far less insecticide on a per acre basis. Consequently, seed treatments are preferred over band or broadcast applications if they effectively control the target pest. Seeds that have been treated with an insecticide or a fungicide 
are always coated with a dye as well to indicate that the seed should not be used as feed. So, never feed colored seed to animals. Pesticides may also be applied to soil or seed, not primarily to protect the seed, but to allow the movement of the pesticide in the vascular system to protect above ground parts of plants. Applications to soil can be made prior to planting, at planting, or post emergence as a drip uh, or a drench, so a drip via the irrigation water, and this depends on the specific product labels and crops. For soil applied systemic insecticides, above ground control of insects usually begins a few days after application and lasts two to three weeks. Seed applied insecticides or seed treatments also tend to provide for two to provide protection for two to three weeks after plants emerge. Many of the insecticides used in this way are neonicotinoids that are highly toxic to bees and this presents a serious hazard where high rates of very long lasting insecticides are used and applied to soil around landscape trees and shrubs where they last for several months and move into the plants for several months. It's also a hazard where treated seeds are used on vast acreages of corn and soybeans. And for vegetable crops where we use these products, we have to be very careful that they are not used very close to bloom because some of them do move into bloom in, for example, cucumbers and pumpkins. Another type of soil pesticide is the fumigant, and methyl bromide has been the most common of all soil fumigants for many years. It's injected into the soil, and the surface is immediately covered with plastic to slow the fumigant's escape. It moves in the gaseous form in the soil and kills a wide range of soil organisms. It dissipates slowly over a few days, then crops are planted through the tarp or mulch, or in a few instances, the tarp or mulch is removed. Soil fumigation is very expensive and not used commonly in Illinois, although it has been used in strawberry plasticulture and in isolated instances for tomato or pepper production. Methyl bromide has been identified as a gas that contributes to ozone depletion in the atmosphere, and alternatives to it are under development as plans to phase out its use are eventually carried out. These are examples of soil fumigation uh, application and a crop grown on a fumigated bed that was fumigated in a manner similar to what you see in the top two pictures. Herbicides applied prior to planting in some fruits and vegetable crops include non-selective herbicides such as Paraquat or Gramoxone and glyphosate. Roundup is systemic, moves into the vascular system to the roots, and kills most plants to which it is applied. Gramoxone or Paraquat kills the tissue it contacts, often killing the above ground portion of the plants, but it is not systemic, so plants that can regrow from roots or crowns will grow back after treatment. Some selective herbicides, the ones that kill certain plants but not others, may be applied to the soil surface prior to planting or after vegetable seeds are planted but before they have emerged to kill germinating weed seeds and small emerged weeds. Atrazine is among the herbicides used in this way in corn. For many small growers with diverse cropping systems, drift to nearby areas with different and susceptible crops and the residual activity of these kinds of herbicides in future rotation crops present challenges that often prevent their safe and effective use. Post-emergence herbicides applied within crop fields after the crop is standing may be selective, for example killing broadleaf weeds in a grass crop such as sweet corn, or they may be non-selective but applied to a resistant crop such as Roundup use in Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. Roundup and Paraquat, both non-selective herbicides, also are used in perennial fruit crops to kill in-row weeds, but they are applied at a time and in a manner where they do not contact green tissue or damage the crop. A 
Among the most common pesticides applied to fruits and vegetables are sprays of insecticides and fungicides to the above ground portions of the plant to protect foliage or fruit from insect feeding or pathogen infection. Most of these sprays are intended to provide lasting control for a few days. Some, however, have little or no residual value after application. These include knockdown insecticides. Either they work only while still in the liquid form, or their chemical residues, although they are effective initially, break down so rapidly that they do not continue to kill insects for very long. Natural pyrethrins are very short-lived. Malathion breaks down rapidly enough uh, so that its pest control value does not last for more than a couple of days in most outdoor uses. Short-lived products are usually the ones that can be used very close to harvest in fruits and vegetables. In some instances, short PHIs are granted for products that are very low in toxicity to humans who will eat the fruits and vegetables, but in general, a short pre-harvest interval does not mean that a pesticide poses a low risk to the applicator, so always be careful. It simply means that the residues left on the crop should be safe to the consumer. Most insecticides and fungicides applied to crops last three to ten days, so maybe a little shorter, maybe a little longer. Rainfall of over an inch removes residues and activity. Time and sunlight also allow degradation. Most insecticides used on plants are contact poisons to insects. The chemical residues rub onto the insect's cuticle, move through the waxy layers, and enter the insect via this path. They do not have to be eaten to enter the insect and cause toxicity. Pesticides may be applied through boom sprayers, airplane mounted sprayers, air blast sprayers, platform mounted sprayers, and other types as well. Where plant foliage prevents a dense canopy that makes it difficult to push a pesticide into the center of the plant with just spray tank pressure, fans that move air with the pesticide provide improved coverage. So you see the air blast sprayer and the platform sprayer that's called an air assist sprayer as well. Both conventional farms and organic farms will have need for sprayers uh, on a variety of scales or sizes. Backpack hand pump sprayers, electric ones, and gas powered sprayers are the entry level setups for many growers. Though they do not cost much, they are not as effective uh, at applying products evenly over larger areas, but they are the starting point for most growers. 15 to 30 gallon spray tanks uh, powered by a 12 volt battery can be mounted on four wheelers or utility vehicles and small pull behind or three mount hitch, uh, three point hitch mounted uh, boom sprayers may also be appropriate for larger crops uh, that are larger acreages of low growing vegetable crops. For growers with a few acres of sweet corn, a high boy sprayer that can pass through the rows even when corn is four to six feet tall is usually a necessary investment. And for orchards and vineyards, again, the air blast sprayer, either a pull behind model or a three point uh, hitch mounted model, uh, becomes necessary as plants become large enough that spray penetration uh, requires air as an additional carrier. And in fact, it's really difficult and time consuming to treat lots of trees effectively with a hand sprayer, and then applicator exposure also becomes a concern. <coughs> Many fungicides are labeled for use on fruits and vegetables, and other disease prevention chemicals such as copper and sulfur compounds may be used primarily as bactericides. Uh, some have limited curative or kickback activity as we mentioned earlier, others are eradicants. Again, most are protectants that uh, prevent infect infections but do not stop or kill out existing infections. Even more than for insecticides, very thorough coverage of plant tissues is necessary for protectant for protectant herbicides to be effective because fungal spores do not crawl around on leaves and encounter the spotty residues that insects may encounter. 
some insecticides and fungicides, as we said before, uh, that are applied to foliage are at least somewhat systemic. Movento is used in apples and moves down the vascular systems to trunks and roots to control woolly apple aphid. Fontellus is locally systemic in uh, apples and some additional crops, both fruits and vegetables. Finally, it's important to distinguish between pesticides that move as tiny liquid particles in the air, aerosols, and pesticides that move as gases in the air. Those are fumigants. Fine aerosol sprays, like those produced by pressurized bug bombs, float through the air and land on exposed surfaces, including the cuticles of insects. They may be used for fly control in packing houses or sighted rooms, but they are not fumigants. They do not penetrate closed spaces, such as kitchen cabinets, drawers, and so on. So these are examples of aerosol applications of fine droplets that contain pesticides. The aerosol floats through the air to reach many exposed surfaces, and I hope the X through the illustration in the lower right is there for obvious reasons. No protective clothing or equipment to keep the pesticide off her skin, out of her eyes, and nothing to prevent her from inhaling it. So nobody should apply a pesticide in that way. Fumigants, in addition to those used in soil fumigation, may be used to disinfest stored grains, flour mills, and ripe fruits and vegetables. Common fumigants include methyl bromide, phosphine, chloropicrin, sulfuryl fluoride, and even carbon dioxide. And not all of these are used, say, to disinfest fruits and vegetables. Some are. Fumigants are highly toxic, and applicators that apply them must be specifically trained and licensed to do so. Gas detection and monitoring or measuring devices and self-contained breathing units are commonly required. Fumigation is a professional's job, not a small fruit and vegetable producer's job. So, pesticides, be they synthetic or natural products, can be toxic to a range of non-target organisms, and they have to be handled appropriately if adverse effects are to be minimized. Protecting pollinators, natural enemies, fish, wildlife, and humans is always a concern. The non-target effects can result from direct application, from drift, from runoff or leaching, and from residues on foods. Two frequent applications favor evolution of resistance in pest species. So what are the logical steps to reduce, reduce risks while still preventing excessive losses to pests? The most common approach to minimizing risks from pest management activities is to use integrated pest management or IPM methods. IPM is based on the use of a range of practices that limit losses to pests while minimizing the environmental damage, human health risks, and dollar costs associated with pest suppression. Tactics include biological control, cultural controls, pest resistant varieties, regulatory programs, and pesticides where needed and in ways that minimize their adverse effects. I urge you to plan and design farming systems that minimize the likelihood of severe pest problems. Steps will include crop rotations, cover crops, plant diversity, tillage, pruning, thinning, ideal planting and harvesting dates, using resistant varieties, managing irrigation very well, and several other steps. IPM then involves monitoring crops to assess the densities of pests and beneficial organisms, or scouting, and using pesticides if needed. The least disruptive pesticides may be synthetic, or they may be of natural origin, though synthetic products cannot be used in organic production. Simple rules govern pesticide use. After designing a farm plan that reduces the likelihood of pest problems, spray only when needed based on results of scouting efforts. Spray only the areas where pest pressure requires it. Rotate within types of pesticides according to modes of action to slow the evolution of resistance. And never apply a pesticide in ways prohibited by the labels. Especially, do not use more than the label instructions. 
do not apply pesticides in excessive winds or too close to neighboring property or sensitive crops. Manage soil erosion and do not apply pesticides to waterways or field borders. Where labels restrict use to protect shallow water supplies, always obey the label. And do not apply pesticides in ways that will poison bees or other pollinators. We'll discuss these recommendations in more detail when we cover IPM in more depth and when we cover insect disease and weed management in fruits and vegetables. One thing that owners of sensitive crops and livestock can do to notify pesticide applicators of their vulnerability to drift is to register their locations on DriftWatch. The DriftWatch Specialty Crop Site Registry is a voluntary communication tool that enables crop producers, beekeepers, and pesticide applicators to work together to protect specialty crops and apiaries. apiaries. It is not a substitute for any state regulatory requirements. Applicators can get advanced integration capabilities to help avoid spraying specialty sites or drift onto those sites and receive notifications when sites are moved or added to the DriftWatch database. Producers have an additional layer of protection against accidental drift. The locations indicated on this site, uh, in this, on this slide, excuse me, this screenshot, are orchards, greenhouses, and high tunnels, cucurbit fields, tomatoes, and other vegetables. Clearly, if you look at that map of Illinois, there were more properties than were registered at this time when this screenshot was taken a few months ago. So a need for greater participation in registering sites is important if that information is going to help applicators avoid damaging those sites. Symbols on this map indicate the locations of apiaries and beehives. Again, although many are shown, there are probably more that need to be registered. Registering on DriftWatch, again, is one more way to let pesticide users know that you are vulnerable to their actions and that they should take all possible precautions. Pesticide users, products that are approved for organic use and those that are not, should all be aware that pesticides can harm humans, applicators, consumers of treated foods, and everyone who lives in the environment. Using pesticides strictly according to label instructions minimizes risk where pesticides may Labels indicate what crops may be treated, how much may be used, when a crop may be treated, and what precautions should be taken to protect applicators and workers who enter treated fields. Pesticide labels are not like brownie recipes. The details are not optional. If a little works well, using a lot is not a better choice. Not spraying and not using maximum allowed rates are available choices. Spraying too often, using too much, those are not available choices. Failure to follow label instructions that protect the environment, workers, and consumers is punishable by law. Pesticides are regulated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and, as I said earlier in Illinois, by the Illinois Department of Agriculture. The U.S. EPA requires data on the environmental fate of pesticide products and their toxicity to test animals. It uses these data to construct details on the pesticide labels. Some states require additional data. Uh, those are primarily New York and California, though they usually still use existing data but develop more restrictive labels according to their policies. The Illinois Department of Agriculture does not do this. It does charge a fee for each company that registers pesticides for sale in the state and for each pesticide product they register. That fee pays for regulatory expenses and the pesticide safety education programs and the state's uh, applicator licensing program. All registered pesticides from the US EPA level are classified as general use versus restricted use products. General use products may be purchased by anyone without proof of knowledge or training but their labels are still the law in terms of how they can be used. Restricted use pesticides may be sold only to licensed pesticide applicators who have passed a licensing exam. Products available to homeowners and others at garden centers and hardware stores 
are exclusively general use products. In some cases, the labels on these products state not for commercial use. This means that produce treated with these pesticides should not be sold. So commercial growers should purchase and use products intended for on-farm use and not products that say not for commercial use. Illinois classifies pesticide applicators as private versus commercial. For fruit and vegetable and small-scale livestock producers, the term private applicator generally can be translated to mean farmer applicator. Someone who uses the pesticide on his or her own property for the production of their crops and livestock or as exchange labor with another farmer. Commercial applicators apply pesticides for hire and their licenses much ma must match the type of for hire application that they're going to do. For example, treating field crops, rights of way, turf, landscape plants, etc. There are several more categories. Operators are workers employed by a company where an applicator with greater training supervises their work. Again, this is in the commercial for hire category. So, for students in this beginning farmer's class, a private applicator's license is the category needed to purchase restricted use pesticides for use on your farm or orchard. For information on educational programs and testing required to obtain a pesticide applicator's license, check the Illinois Pesticide Safety Education Program's website. Dates for training and testing are listed here. And even if you do not plan to obtain a pesticide applicator's license, taking the training offered by this program is a good idea for all growers. The training sessions include information on safe handling, calibration, application methods, and much more, all of which is useful whether the product you apply is general use, restricted use, or even an OMRI-approved product for organic production. We'll cover many more details about pest, management's and pest management excuse me, in fruits and vegetables, but this summary was designed to provide an overview of pesticide use and regulation. Please contact me or others who have provided instruction on these topics and other topics during our training programs. Pesticides are often necessary in, fruits and in fruit and vegetable production. Using them responsibly and effectively can protect crops from losses and protect your profits. Using them incorrectly or irresponsibly can cost money, fail to protect crops, and present risks to others. Be sure to use accurate resources to make decisions on pesticide use and crop protection. Thank you.